Good morning. Anybody thankful to be at church this morning? Even if they make fun of your clothes, that's all right. We're still here. At, we're still at church. Well, like you, like you heard Pastor Courtney say, I've uh, been on paternity leave for the last month or so as my family was growing. And, and here's a picture of our newest addition to the family. That is Hank Jordan right there, the little one. Uh, Barrett is our oldest. He's the one creepily holding his head. That's scary. And then Wells is the one who has this look like, how can I hurt this baby? <laughs> and uh, it's been going well. Uh, it's been going really well. Lots of people have been asking us where we get names for our kids. Uh, our oldest, Barrett, uh, and Wells, and Hank. And our first names are all just names that we really like, and we just decided these are names we like and want to name our kids. The middle names have meaning. Uh, Barrett's middle name is Michael, which is my wife's father's name. Uh, Wells is Jeffrey, which is my dad's name, and Hank is Jordan, which is my middle name. So all the middle names have meaning. And if you're doing the math, you're realizing that my three boys make up Michael, Jeffrey, Jordan. So together, my boys are the GOAT of the greatest of all time for basketball. We're setting them up for success there. Uh, that was intentional, okay? That was, not by my wife, but by me. I thought it out, and I succeeded in my plan. Praise God. Hey, I'm excited to share with you this morning as we continue this series, A Mighty Move of God. And if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, we're going to be starting in there. Um, I'm excited as we are going in this series. And like you've heard, I encourage you, be in church, be ready, be, be prepared as you walk into this place for a move of God in your life, in our church, and it's going to overflow into our city. And I'm, I'm believing it and I'm excited for it. But we're in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, and we're going to start in verse 11. If you don't have your Bible, that's all right. You can follow along on the screen. It says, When Solomon had finished the temple of the Lord in the royal palace and had succeeded in carrying out all he had in mind to do in the temple of the Lord and in his own palace, the Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer and chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. So what we see here is, is Solomon, he builds a temple for God. He prepares a place for God. And I want to ask you this question this morning. Have you prepared a place for God in your life? Have you set aside time? Have you set aside opportunities for God to move in your life? Both in your individual life, in your, in your personal life, but also corporately. Are you coming into church prepared for a mighty move of God? I know you're here right now, but can I challenge you? Are you going to Sunday school after this? Did you go to Sunday school before this? Are you planning on coming tonight at six o'clock? Are you plugged in on a Wednesday night? I'm not saying this to guilt trip you, but what I'm saying is that if we want a mighty move of God, it takes us stepping up, stepping out, and doing things like never before. I feel like God gave me this word for youth, and I feel like it's for our church as a whole. And it's this, is if you wanna get results that no one else is getting, you have to do things that no one else is doing. Man, we're looking around. I'm not seeing too many big revivals taking place. Like, it seems like it's a, a quiet thing. You want to get a result no one else is getting, you have to do things no one else is doing. And as I prepared for this week, I was reading and I was listening to stories of people who, who had experienced revival. And something that stood out to me was just how different it looked for people. Like, they would show up to church expecting God to move. Every time the door was open, they were in God's house ready for him to move. Everything looked different. Like I read stories of how people would say, you could tell when someone was in revival because their hair hadn't been done, their clothes were a little dirty, you drove by their house, their grass was long. Why? Because they weren't distracted with all those things. They didn't have time to do laundry. They didn't have time to mow their yard. They were too busy trying to go after the presence of God. If we want a mighty move of God, it's going to take you doing things that no one else is doing. It's going to take you saying, I'm all in ready for a move of God. Are you creating a place in your life for a move of God? Continue reading. It says, I've heard your prayer. I've chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. Verse 13, when I shut up the heavens so there's no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people. I want to stop right there. It's a weird place to stop, I, I know, but let's stop right there. So what we read was that God chose that place, that that's where he was going to be, and now he's saying, I'm going to be here, but you know, when I decide to have a drought, 
when I send bugs to destroy all the crops, when all of you guys get sick, and you start to wonder, like, God, didn't you just say that you were going to be there? Why are you now doing all these things? It, it, it led me to, to start thinking of James chapter 1, verse 2, where it says, consider it pure joy when you face trials. Man, I wonder how many times we have gone through trials, we have gone through difficult things in our life, and we sit there and we think, man, I must have done something bad. I must have done something wrong. This is God's punishment for me. But nowhere in Scripture do we see that all trials, all punishment comes from you doing something bad, you doing something wrong. Maybe God sees your commitment to him, and he's, he's, he's drawing that out. He, he's showing you that. Consider it joy. When I shut up the heaven so there's no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people, verse 14, if my people who are called by my name, if my people called by my name, turn to your neighbor and say, that's you. To the neighbor you just ignored because you don't like them as much and tell them that's you too. That's you. My people called by my name. Can we just take a moment and recognize how amazing this is that the God, the creator of all the universe, calls you his people. He's called you by name. And when you're in a faith relationship with him, what you see is it's a very intimate relationship. It's not just like a master and his servant. It's not just a God and his worshipers, but it's a father and his children. Praise God that we can have this sort of intimate relationship with God, that even though we sin, even though we mess up, even though we make mistakes, that God the Father comes in and his grace abounds all the more. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. This morning, as we continue this series, A Mighty Move of God, I've, I've titled this message, if you're taking notes this morning, because note takers are world changers, the title is this, Paying the Price for a Move of God. And what we see here in this passage is we see the formula for a move of God. The formula right here, if you want a move of God, here are the steps for a move of God. And the first thing we see is this, if my people who are called by my name, will humble themselves. He's asking them to humble themselves. He wants them to get to a place to realize that they cannot save themselves out of their problems. We cannot save ourselves out of our situations. And really this idea of humility and humbling ourselves, this is still a struggle for many today. How often do we think, well, I can get this done. I can figure it out, I can save myself. If I just do this and this and this, it's all going to work out. But humbling ourselves is recognizing our full dependency on God. And if we want a mighty move of God in your life, in this church, in this city, then we need to get to a place where we say, I can't, but he can. We need to get to a place where we say, it's not about me. It's not about our traditions, our organization, my feeble attempts at, at getting the job done. None of that adds up. It's all about what he can do. We remove our pride. Why? Because then when a mighty move of God happens, it wasn't about you. You can't take credit for that. Humbling ourselves. It's realizing our spiritual poverty without God's grace. Without God, I, what am I? I am nothing. We humble ourselves. You want a mighty move of God, you need to humble yourself. If my children, my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. Point number two is pray. Pray. Can we talk about prayer for just a moment? Are you okay with that? Is anybody opposed to talking about prayer for just a moment? Good. If you raised your hand, I wouldn't care. I would still talk about it. I wanna talk about prayer because I, I just felt as I was prepping this week that we need to address how we pray. We need to look at this, at, at how do we pray? How do we go about in our prayer life? And, and I wanna give you, if you will, just hang tight with me, I wanna give you a little mini sermon within the sermon, is that okay? So if you're taking notes, point number one, humble yourself. Point number two, pray, mini sermon, how to pray. And I've got eight points. <laughs> We got this. I got eight points 
that I want to share with you for how to pray. Turn to Matthew chapter 6 with me. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. Matthew 6, verse 5. Perfect. It's up on the screen. It says, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you that they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to the Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Point number one for how to pray is this. Get a place. You need, if you want to see a mighty move of God, then you need to take prayer seriously, and you need to get a place. We see Jesus, he often withdrew from the crowd, and he went off on his own to spend time in prayer. You need to do that. You need to set aside a time and a place that you are going to pray. Well, Pastor Zach, my prayer life is I just pray anywhere, anytime. Like, that's just how I pray. And I'm not telling you that that's not okay. That is okay. I encourage you to do that. But if you're only, if you're only ever praying anywhere at any time, what you'll find is you won't ever have time for God. If we don't make time for God, we won't have time for God. And if you want a mighty move of God, you need to spend time praying and you need to get a place. Continue reading. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Number one, get a place. Number two, this one's my favorite, get to the point. Get to the point. Like, it's not about how good your vocabulary is and saying all these fancy words and spending all of this time. Like, the longer I pray, the more powerful the prayer is. Not necessarily true. He's saying, I I know what you need. Get to the point. Don't just babble on. What he's saying is, be yourself when you're praying. You don't have to try to be like someone else or, or talk like someone else. Be yourself. I love this quote by Smith Wigglesworth. He says, rarely do I pray for more than a half an hour but I never go more than a half an hour without praying. I'm not praying for more than 30 minutes, but I'm never praying, I'm never going more than 30 minutes without praying. Get to the point, do it often, get your place. Continue reading, it says, this then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven. Point number three is connect relationally. He is our Father. And when we can connect relationally, and it's not just this this far off God, or it's not just this boss up in the sky, when we connect relationally that he is our father, we talk different. We see that this relationship is different. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. The next one is declare his greatness. God, you are so good. You are worthy. I thank you, God. You're mighty. You're a powerful God. Declare his greatness. Our Father, art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Next one, point number five is submit your will. It's not about what you want anymore. It's not about what you need. It's saying, God, what is it that you need? God, what is it that you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? God, I pray that you would open up the right doors, that you would close the wrong doors. I pray that I would follow in your will for my life. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. The next thing is depend on him for everything. I want want you to think about that for a moment. What would your life look like if you depended on God for everything? I was challenged this week as I was thinking through this point and just the aspect of of giving to, to missions And what would my life look like if I depended on God for everything when it came to that? And I felt like he said, I want you to give this amount. And I'm not depending on my budget. I'm not depending on how I can come up with it. But I'm saying, okay, this is what you want me to do. I'm going to do it. And I'm going to trust that you're going to get these other things done for me. That I'm, I'm leaning on you. I'm depending on you. Depend on him for everything. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our our debts as we forgive those who have debts against us, our debtors. Next point is this, get grace, give grace. Forgiveness is key to seeing a mighty move of God. And if, if you are struggling with this idea of unforgiveness, I am telling you right now, unforgiveness will block a mighty move of God in your life. It'll block, it'll be a total block. And so often we feel entitled to our unforgiveness. Well, they hurt me, they deserve this. No, 
when you are holding unforgiveness against someone else, it's not hurting the other person, it's only hurting you. And just like we receive forgiveness, we need to give forgiveness to other people. Now here's what's crazy. We've gone seven points in this mini sermon. We're to the very end of this prayer and we haven't got to the part of the prayer that most of us spend the most time on. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Point number eight is submit your request. What is it that you need from God? Isn't it crazy how so often our prayer life isn't spent on all these other things, but it's spent on, God, I need this. God, help me with this. God, lead me in this. God, I, I need you to come through. And I need you to do this for me. Now, I'm not saying that you can't ask God for stuff. I want to encourage you. You should ask God for stuff. He wants you to, he wants you to present your requests to him. But is that what your whole prayer life looks like? Think for a moment, if you're married in the room, think for a moment how your marriage would be if you treated your spouse the same way you treat your relationship with God. Would it be healthy? Imagine me with my wife, Maren, and uh, I wake up in the morning, ah, I, I'm busy, I, I don't have time to talk right now. I sit down to eat a meal, thanks Maren for my food. And then I just kind of go on, and, and then, oh, Maren, I need this. Hey, Maren, can you help me with this? Hey, Maren, I, I need this. Hey, tonight, I'm, I'm going to spend some time talking with you. Oh, you know what? It's really late. I'm just going to say a prayer kind of as I go to sleep. I'm going to talk to my wife as I go to sleep. But I'm going to start falling asleep about halfway through. How unhealthy of a marriage would that be? If I only ever asked her for something, and that was the extent of our relationship. But what we see is that prayer is our way of communicating with God. It's not just me asking, it's not just me doing that, but I'm praising him, I'm talking to him, I'm listening to him. You want a mighty move of God, we need to learn how to pray. So we see point number one this morning is humble yourself. Number two is to pray. Point number three, seek his face. My people are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. You know, as I was thinking about this, seeking his face, I started thinking about this idea of hide and seek, right? Anybody here ever play hide and seek before? Anybody? Classic game, right? I started thinking about when you are the seeker, right? And you're counting 99, 100, ready or not, here I come. What goes into seeking? Like maybe... Maybe if you're playing with a, a little kid, it's, it's not much that goes into it. But what if you're playing with someone and they're, they're good at hiding? You know what's going to go into that? It's going to take effort from you to find them. It's going to take time. And finding them, seeking, finding their face is your goal. Are you putting effort, are you putting time, is seeking out God's face your goal? Because if we want a mighty move of God, we need to seek his face. And I love that this verse, it says to seek his face. Because I think so often instead of seeking his face, you know what we do? Is we seek his hand. I think of my son Barrett, who's four years old. Anybody here ever had a four-year-old before? If you are raising your hand, you know you should be praying for me right now, okay? <laughs> We're at the stage in life where it seems like he's asking for everything, right? Right? We're in the store, and it's, hey, Dad, can I have this? Dad, can I have this? Dad, I want this. And if you were at the Jordan Creek Target yesterday around 4.30, you would have heard us throughout the whole store <laughs> as we were going about. And what I've found becoming a father is that I love buying stuff from him. I love getting him stuff. Like, I love surprising him. I love getting him presents. That gives me joy. Any parents can attest to that? Like, it's fun doing that. It gives me joy to do those things. But what I've found is that more than just giving him stuff, what gives me so much joy is when he just wants to be with me. Is when he just wants me to hold him. Like the other morning, I, I was up early, I was prepping for this morning. I was sitting at the island and he woke up early, he came down, he came and sat on my lap. I asked him, Bear, do you want breakfast? Do you want me to make you some oatmeal? No. Want me to get you some cereal? No. You want milk, juice, water? No. Well, what, what do you want? I just want you to hold me. 
You know what blesses the heart of the Father? is not just me giving him stuff, even though that blesses me, but it's when he just wants to be with me. And it's our responsibility as children of God, not to seek after the hand of God, not to seek after the blessings that God has for us, but to seek after his face. Because what you'll find is God, the person, the heart of God, the face of God is all you need. And when we just seek after the blessings, those things might be good for a moment, but those things will never be enough because they aren't God. You want a mighty move of God, seek after the face of God. Can we as a church, can we make a decision that we are gonna seek after God's face? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. The fourth and final point this morning is this, is to turn from your wicked ways. Turn. This is ultimately the discipline of repentance. I'm, I'm, I'm turning from something. I'm turning from sin. I'm turning from those ways. And if we're turning from something, that means then we're turning to something. I want to ask you, what area in your life do you need repentance? Maybe it's a sin. Lying, cheating, adultery. Maybe you say, well, I haven't, I haven't cheated on my spouse. Yeah, but maybe that... I would say that addiction to pornography, hate, and there's, there's sin that, that you need to repent from. Maybe you're saying, well, I'm not really struggling. With, there's not really a sin in my life. Well, that's okay because I want to encourage you that if we want to get results no one else is getting, we have to do things no one else is doing. And I want you to evaluate your life and look in your life. What things in my life have the place that only God should? What is it that has my attention? What has my time? Where is my money going? And those things might not be bad things. They might actually be good, but what you'll find is that they are not God. Maybe it's a relationship. It's a person. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's possessions. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's a hobby. It's a sport. What in your life has a place that only God should have. And I believe that as a church, that when we turn from our ways, when we turn from the things of this world and we turn to God and we begin to seek his face, we will see a mighty move of God in your life, in this church, in this city, and in this nation. Turning from our ways and turning back to God. I believe God has a move, a mighty move that he has for this church. And we're on the edge of something, but it's going to take us being real. It's going to take us being honest, digging deep, and doing things that other people wouldn't do to get results that other people aren't getting. Are you ready for a move of God? I really felt this week as I was preparing, God, God placed this on my heart. That there's someone in the room who's in a place in their walk with God of complacency. Maybe you're here each week. Maybe you even serve somewhere in the church. But if you were to evaluate your life, what you might find is that your relationship with God isn't as strong as it used to be and isn't as strong as it could be. Like your devotion time, it used to be this, uh, you had a place, you had a time, you were very intentional, but now it's like, ah, I don't have time for that today. You used to be very intentional that you, were, you would come into church expecting, you, you came into church every week. You were here for Sunday school. You were here on, on Sunday nights. You were here on Wednesday nights. And now, well, there's sports that are going on. Well, that's our family night. So we, we, we can't do anything that night. Family night? Family night? What if family night wasn't us playing games and us watching a movie together. What, what if it was in the house of God, going after the presence of God, waiting for a move of God together as a family? Man, family night, I'm not telling you not to have family night. Family night is important. But what if instead of giving up a night in the house of God, what if we gave up that sport? What if we gave up that hobby and said, that's a good thing, but it's not God. We need our family time, and we need to make sure that tonight, that Sunday nights, that Wednesday nights, that when the doors are open, that we are in the house of God going after the presence of God. 
You want a mighty move of God, church. It's time we get up and out of where we have been. Every single one of us, we can get out of that. We need to get out of this place that we have been in and we need to seek after the face of God, going after a mighty move of God. Would you stand with me all across this room? And would you just begin right now just to pray with me, just begin asking God, God, what is it in my life that's hindering me from a move? What is it in my life that I need to get rid of that's blocking me? Begin to invite him in. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Holy Spirit, begin to move here. We want to see your face. We want to see a move of your spirit. We want to see miracles happen. morning we talked about four different things the price that we have to pay for a move of God and maybe one of those things are something that you know this is a price I need to pay and the first one is maybe you recognize I need to humble myself I need to set my pride down I need to, to recognize that only God and if that's you and you're in a place this morning you're ready for a move of God but you're saying my pride's in the way and I need to humble myself if that's you would you just raise your hand just as an outward expression of an inward decision I see your hands Yep. The next is this, we're talking about prayer. And as we talked about prayer, maybe you recognize that my prayer life isn't what it could be, it isn't what it should be, and I need to set aside time, I need to set aside a place, I need to go after God, and I wanna, I wanna change my prayer life. And if that's you and you're saying, my prayer life, man, I, I'm about to up my game for my prayer life. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? My hand's up. Yep. The next is this, so you say, I've maybe been seeking the hand of God instead of the face of God, but today I changed that and I'm seeking after who God is, not just what he can do for me. If that's you, would you just raise your hand? Saying, I'm seeking after the face of God. Hands up all over. The last is this, there's a, a thing in your life that you need to turn from. Maybe it's a sin, maybe it's not a sin. Maybe it's just something that you put in a place that it shouldn't be in that place and it's time to remove that thing. It's time to repent, it's time to turn from it and turn back to God. If that's you and there's something you need to turn from this morning, you need to ask for repentance, would you just raise your hand and say, that's me, I need repentance in that area. Hands up all over. Here's how I wanna close this morning. Church, I don't know about you, but I am ready for a mighty move of God. And if we want to see a mighty move of God, it's going to take us getting up and it's going to take us moving. It's going to take us acting on what the Holy Spirit is leading us to. And then this morning, if you raise your hand, that's, that's amazing. I want to invite you to come in just a moment. But if you are here and you are saying, I am ready for a mighty move of God. I'm ready for a mighty move of God in my life, in this church, in my family, in this city. I'm ready for it and I'm committing to seeing a mighty move of God happen. I'm going to prepare. I'm going to get ready for a move of God. If that's you, I'm gonna count down from three. And when I get to one, I want you to physically move out of your seat and move forward saying, God, I'm ready for a move of your spirit. I'm ready for a mighty move of your power in my life, in my family, in this church. We're ready for a move of God. Three, you're ready to leave the past in the past. You're leaving it back there. You're saying, I'm not going back to those ways. I'm changing some things in my life and I'm moving forward to a move of God. Two, what we see is God is a motion activated God, that when you move, God will begin to move. And if you are ready for a move of God, it is time to move in three, two, one. Let's seek after God. Let's go after a mighty move of God, church. Come on, if you're ready, come forward. Let's surrender to him this morning. Come on, church. A mighty move of God. Are you expecting a mighty move of God? Are you ready for a mighty move of God? Because once we are expecting it, it changes everything. When you walk into the building, it, you walk in different. When you walk into the building and you're expecting a mighty move of God, guess what it looks like? It looks like we show up on time because I'm ready to praise God from the moment that that first chord is strung. I'm ready for a mighty move of God. It takes us looking different takes us maybe acting different but if we want to get results no one else is getting it takes us doing things no one else is doing now I want to ask you will you prepare your heart not just when you walk into church for a move of God but will you prepare your heart outside of the church for a move of God because the prepare 
part of it is a big part. If you were here last week, you heard Pastor Austin and Pastor August share about preparing. And if you weren't, go back and listen. But we need to prepare ourselves for a move of God. Because you know what's not going to happen? You're not going to be able just to show up on a Sunday morning and all of a sudden it's like, boom, revival happens and you didn't do anything to prepare for it. It's going to take us preparing for a move of God. Has anybody ever been to like a youth camp in the summer, like church camp in the summer, maybe when you were younger as a, as a kid? It, it makes me think of, remember the Thursday night, the last night of camp. You walk into camp, you walk into the sanctuary, and you know like God's presence is there, His power is there, and you're like, what is God going to do right now? Why? Because you've got rid of all your distractions. You're away from the, the people that are distracting you. Current day, you're away from your cell phone, you're away from technology, you're focused on a move of God. Can we come in to church on Sunday mornings, on Sunday nights, anytime the door is open saying, I am ready to see how God is going to move in this moment. Think about the power that comes when we as a church, instead of showing up and we're, we're, we're partially there, we're like 10% filled up with the, with the presence of God. Think about what that looks like compared to you spent all week preparing for a moment in the house of God. Think about the power that comes from us together as a family coming forward saying, I'm ready for a move of God together. Will you prepare for a move of God? Are you ready for a move of God? I want to encourage you. In youth this last week, we, we challenged our students. We called them to 14 days of praying and fasting beginning this Thursday. 14 days. There's not many students across the globe that are, that are fasting. But if you want to get results no one else is getting, you got to do things no one else is doing. And I want to encourage you to join us for 14 days beginning Thursday of giving up food and seeking after the face of God. In addition to giving up food, because fasting is giving up food, but in addition, giving up social media, giving up TV, that means the news. I know, I know students that are, that are talking about giving up their Xbox. Man, a student that got a brand new Xbox a couple weeks ago for Christmas and saying, I'm ready to give it up for three weeks to seek after face God, you want to get results no one else is getting, you got to do things no one else is doing. Church, it's time we experience and we go after a mighty move of God for yourself, for your family, for this church, for our city, and for this nation, for all over the world. It is time. The time is now but it's gonna take you doing the work to see that mighty move of God happen. I love that verse. Can we go back to that verse in 2 Chronicles? If my people who are called by not my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then, it's an if-then statement. If you do this, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. How many know it's time for healing? It's time for healing. It's time for healing. Can we just for a moment, just hands up all across this room, just begin to invite God into your life. Maybe there's healing in your own life. There's healing in, in a family member's, in a friend's life that they need. There's healing in our nation. There's healing in this city. Can you just begin to pray? Can you just begin to seek after God? God, heal this land. Heal our hearts. Hear us from heaven, God. We want more of you. We want a mighty move of your spirit. We're making room. We're, we're committing to this time with you. A mighty move of God. Come on, church, enter in. Not when words are on the screen, but right now. Just you and God. Lift up your prayer. Making room for God. That's what we're committing to. I'm going to make room so that God can move. I'm going to prepare so that God will move. And I hope you're excited. I hope you're challenged. I hope you're encouraged. I don't know about you, but I, I, I can't wait to dive in deeper. I can't wait to, to have my next devotional time with God. I can't wait to see what he's going to reveal to me. I can't wait for tonight's service to see how he's going to move. I can't wait for conversations that are going to begin having out there because God's moving in and through me. I can't wait. It's a mighty move of God. It takes us doing different things, looking different, 
but getting results no one else is getting. A mighty move of God. Church, I hope that you join us throughout this series. I hope you come back tonight. I hope you join us in fasting. I hope you get plugged into a Sunday school. There's 11 o'clock Sunday school still for you to go to. Get plugged in on a Wednesday night because I believe we're on the edge of a mighty move of God happening in our church.